Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Matt Greco, the Events Manager at Life University, part of PSS. And today we have our regular monthly nutrition presentation from Dina D'Alessandro. Uh, looks like we have some new attendees, so welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, registering and going on our PSS events uh, page. And with that, I'm just gonna hand it directly over to Dina. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And especially to those of you who are new, welcome. It's nice to meet you, even though I can't see you. I'm very honored always to be able to present on a variety of topics. Every month we've been doing this, and I was brought into the loop uh, a little bit late last year, around November, December, I believe it was. And so my name is Dina D'Alessandro. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about me in a second, but just to share some general objectives. I was just telling Matthew, whenever I do speak on certain topics, I feel like I can go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole and inflammation is one of those topics. So I'm going to do my best to keep things as simple as possible. But if you are interested in learning a little bit more or doing a deeper dive, then, you know, just bring it up the chain, let Matthew know, and maybe we'll make that another topic for discussion in a future webinar. So here's what we're going to hopefully take away from today's conversation about understanding the difference between acute and chronic inflammation, learning a little bit more or identifying what are known as the inflammatory foods. And I'll spoiler alert, there's not a lot of them, and there's a lot of multifactorial things going on in the world of inflammation. And then the last thing about some lifestyle factors that might help you with reducing inflammation. Some housekeeping items here. Uh, if you've attended before, you know, I believe the session is being recorded. So you probably heard that on your way in. I'm flying solo here on my end. So I'll keep an eye in the chat. So if you have any questions or anything like that, that you want to plug in, you can either put it in the chat, just make sure you choose the drop down that says, I think everyone instead of hosts and panelists or something like that, or there's also a Q and A box option. So I'll try my best every few slides just to keep an eye in those uh, sections in case questions are coming up as I progress through the slides. If not, I usually have this about, you know, 40 ish minutes or so. So there's plenty of time at the end of the presentation for us to have a more in depth Q and a, but with that being said, I always make sure I disclaim that just because I'm a registered dietitian, I'm not your registered dietitian. I'm not part of your interdisciplinary team. So please make sure that if you are Get, gleaning any information from these webinars. It's educational, informational only. Don't start trying to do something or stop doing something unless you've already discussed it with your own personal physicians, your medical team, et cetera. And get clearance from that too, right? Try not to start or stop something just because you think it's a good idea. You never know what damage might be done or if there are any interactions, especially when it comes to things like medicines, et cetera. Please make sure that you're speaking with your healthcare providers and getting clearance from them. So for those of you who are just meeting me for the first time, and a reminder for those of you who've met me before, I am a registered dietitian. We sometimes also go by the term nutritionist. Those are interchangeable here in my world. I'm a second career though. I didn't start off as a registered dietitian. I started off in project management and a lot of other industries and other fields that I worked in back in the day um, with a, I had a bachelor of arts in communication. I was planning on going into like I don't know, the media world of some sort, but as life sometimes happens, things happen and things brought me into different directions. And I decided to go back to school about uh, 10 years, 11 years ago now and do this. So I'm really excited about this new career. It's granted me a lot of great opportunities, much like working with all of you. And because of me going back to school, I also made a lot of great friends and connections up at the CUNY Lehman College campus in the Bronx. That is where I went back to school, where I went to my for my dietetic internship, where I finished my Master of Science in Nutrition. And they hired me as an adjunct lecturer for undergraduate and graduate studies. And then they also hired me to be the on-campus dietitian at the Student Health Center there. So I work with a really wide variety of patient populations, both in age and cultures, like a lot of diversity going on on the campus, of, as I'm sure you know, from New York City in general, there's so many different backgrounds and ethnicities and racial groups, et cetera. And then also with chronic conditions too. So I work with people who are just looking for a healthy lifestyle or some people who are dealing with allergies or gastrointestinal situations or people who are recently diagnosed with something like diabetes or kidney issues. So I don't really specialize in too much. I have I have a lot of experience in a few things because that's unfortunately the name of the game with some of these conditions, but I try to be more of, I try to look at my role as a, a, a patient 
advocate. I'm trying to empower people with whom I work in whatever setting that might be, similar to even doing things like this with the webinar, just to share with you the knowledge and education that you need so that if we don't work in a more uh, specific role, if I'm not part of your healthcare team, then at least you have the language and the information to take back with you, to ask of your doctors and your specialists, to have a little bit more understanding of maybe the language that they're using with you in the sessions. And you'll see that come up a lot in today's webinar as well. Um, in the internet world, I also own and operate a very large virtual platform under the name of Dish with Dina. So I do a lot of things on a YouTube channel and I have a podcast and I just, I love, right? Media was my first background. So I like marrying the two things and, uh, and just kind of playing around on social media as best as I can. It can be a little bit overwhelming on there if any of you are involved in that too. I have some background too. Uh, CDC trained me as a prevent type two diabetes lifestyle coach. That was a year pro, a year long program that I worked with a variety of people from different backgrounds as well, different age groups as well, in helping them understand uh, issues surrounding potentially being at risk for diabetes. I've also had the great opportunity of being asked to be part of research studies or being interviewed on some of these national websites and different kinds of periodicals, especially in the dietitians world. These are uh, like today's dietitian is a trade publication. So that's kind of cool too. And doing things like this, I get asked to do presenting. I show up at people's health fairs and you plug me in wherever you can. And I also mentor and supervise or precept the next, the next generation of dietitians as well. So whether they are part of my nutrition students at Lehman College or they find me through other avenues where uh, they're in their dietetic internships and I help them with doing career development, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm in it, friends. This is like I eat, breathe, and drink, sleep, all of this stuff. I take a shower and I forget sometimes if I washed my hair or didn't wash my hair because I'm coming up with all of these ideas. So I hope you can see my passion for this field and for this discussion. And I hope that you take away some good information. With that said, so for those of you who were with me back in, I think it was November, December, we had a SMART goal webinar at the end of last year with with PSS here. And so I figured it's July. And so if you weren't there, that's totally okay, but it's July. So let's just take a minute are you where you were hoping you would be at this point when you started setting up some of the goals for yourself, whether it was the end of last year leading into the new year, 2024, or if maybe, you know, every month or every quarter you think never again, am I doing this or tomorrow is the day I start doing that. So I just want to do a quick little check-in. You can feel free if you want to, to share with me in the chat, any updates that you have, or this might just be a good time to acknowledge either some challenges that you might be dealing with, figure out where some of those obstacles might be, how you might be able to overcome some of those barriers, or pat yourself on the back if you are currently accomplishing anything that you said you would set, set out to do. And you've been doing it pretty regularly, so congratulations on that. On my end, I continue to have <laughs> physical ailments. I'm dealing with a rotator cuff injury now. So I have to go back to the physical therapist like twice a week. Let's put it in a little bit of a wrench in my plans. Um, the past me would end up saying, juggle all the things anyway, right? Take the two hours or however many time you need to do at home exercises, and then just stay up really late and finish the rest of your work. And the new me is just trying to give myself some grace and compassion and just say, there's a reason why your body is feeling this way. And this might tie into the topic we're going to talk about today as well. So some things will just have to wait and some things are just not going to get done and some things may never get done and I'm going to have to be okay with it. And next month's a new month and we'll see how we play by ear, what goes on in the future. But my priority right now is making sure I take care of my physical and my mental body so that I'm not, nothing, nothing worse is hopefully going to happen to me. All right. So with that being said, let's go into our current discussion around inflammation. So just generally speaking, right, our body wants to protect us all the time as best as it can. And we'll see too how we, as the human outside people, you know, what kind of role we're playing with this, but our body has a regular natural response to fight infection and to keep us uh, 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 you know, avoiding injury if we can, or if there is an injury taking place, it's going to help us with taking care of that. 
So it's part of our immune system where inflammation comes from, but it's also part of our nervous system as well. So if you were with me a few months ago when we talked about gut health, gut, like if the immune system is built up in the smaller intestine, the small intestine of the lower part of our gut. This is where those good bacteria are. As we age, naturally our body does undergo wear and tear. We're living a lot longer than we used to many, many decades ago and centuries ago. So, you know, it, it makes sense that as we progress through our life cycle, our body is, doesn't really fend off a lot of things like it used to. And we might also be dealing with multiple things happening at the same time or taking multiple types of medications. And so our immune system might be weakened. So just by naturally speaking, as we progress into the older population, 60, 65, 70 and above, we're automatically categorized as immunocompromised. So our immune system isn't what it used to be. And this is why it might be a little bit difficult or challenging for us to try to implement factors and lifestyle modifications to strengthen our immune system because, you know, our body's not not really helping us sometimes as we are in the older ages or the older stages of our life but it wants to, it wants to. So I want to first just forgive me for some of the language I'm using today because it's quite, it feels very sciencey and I really do my best to, to simplify the language. But as I've come to know in your group, I know that you are all a bunch of smarty pants. So some of the language you might already be familiar with. And also as I'm coming to learn too, through my own experience, my experience with my mom who's in her eighties now, uh, doctors don't simplify their language sometimes. So I want you to recognize some of the language that might be used when you're talking to your doctors. And also I've come to see a lot of commercials, whether it's commercials about a specific condition or a pharmaceutical for a specific condition, they use some of this language too. So these might seem new to you, or maybe you've heard of this, this language before, but these are really inflammatory cells. This is your little body's army of fighters coming to do what it needs to do. You got your EMT crew coming in. Those are your neutrophils. Their first reporting for duty to help fight infection. And this could be anything like you have a paper cut or you walked into poison ivy or something a little bit more severe, which we'll talk about in a second. That middle section there, those are your monocytes and macrophages. I always think of these like Pac-Man, like they kind of chomp, chomp, chomp. They eat away or maybe like a house cleaning crew, they come and eat away and clear away the debris. And they also start helping with repairing our tissue and our cells that might be damaged from the inflammation that was happening. The eosinophils and basophils, this is giving me a bit of a flashback to my very first classes in, I think it was biology and a and anatomy and physiology, where we had a lot of tests on this stuff, but eosinophils and basophils, these will help combat those infections or whatever is going on as far as the um, disease states that we're in. So something like if you have a parasite or a virus or whatever, this will also, these will also release histamine. So we talked about histamine in our webinar a few months ago when we did, or whenever one of the last webinars with food allergies and intolerance, we talked about histamine. So those are the chemical reactions. Like if you, you know, you're having an allergic reaction to something that's um, showing the signs of that where you're coughing, wheezing, et cetera. That's, that's what's being released at that time. So those are just like who's involved and what inflammation is. To further define this too, we have two types of inflammation. We have an acute and we have chronic. Acute is very short-term, short-lived, not super serious. Again, paper cut, poison ivy, maybe you have a cold, something that your body, you can maybe physically see some of the symptoms there, like you have a fever or there's a redness or a swelling around a particular area, like you banged your toe on something or you got a bruise. This could last as small as you know a few hours, or it could last a few days or a week or so on if your body needs that time to heal. But it's still acute. It's still considered not super serious and very, very short term. When it turns into chronic, or if you end up with chronic inflation and inflammation, this is where it can last for a longer period of time. And longer period of time can be defined as just months or many, many years or for the rest of your life. Unfortunately, chronic inflammation also takes over a lot of things. So we'll see in the coming slide that it can spread out through the rest of the body. And it can also lead to damaging some of the healthy things that you have going on too. So things that might not have had issues before, one thing starts leading to another. It's this not so great gift that keeps on giving. And because of that, it's linked to many other system and organ diseases. So I just want to share here, and you're going to see me look down a little bit because this is a lot of information as usual for me to keep in my brain. 
But what can happen sometimes as to where things turn from acute to chronic or from not having an issue at all to chronic, because what I'm learning about inflammation is it feels very bi-directional. Something can cause chronic inflammation to happen and chronic inflammation can then cause something else to happen. So if you have in your body, if you have a failure for those inflammatory cells to do their job appropriately and to really get rid of the debris and the dead cells and repair the tissue, that can end up leading to chronic inflammation. If you have already an autoimmune disorder, and like I said, just by being in a senior population, you're technically considered immunocompromised, like your body isn't as able to fight off certain infections. And especially if you're already dealing with a specific chronic disease like kidney issues or diabetes, you know, you could impair that as well. So that could lead to furthering the risk factors for chronic inflammation. And if you have recurring episodes of acute inflammation, if you're constantly dealing with something like a UTI, right, urinary tract infection, taking antibiotics, then you get another one three months from now and then you're taking more antibiotics. You're putting a lot of stress on your body and maybe also some of the medicines, which we'll talk about a little bit too coming up, can also exacerbate the condition because they're suppressing your immune system. And then it's just like this you know, nasty, vicious cycle. So with that said, I also wanna just be careful with not scaring everybody too much. Uh, this is just, again, education and information for you to take into account. If you feel like there are things that are going on that you have no control over, we're going to try to see if we can allay some of those things or give you guidance on how to take the next steps for that. And obviously, you know, make sure you're still speaking to your health team, your healthcare practitioners, your providers, et cetera. So here is this, I apologize, this is probably a little hard to see unless you're sitting in a room where it's really big, in which case it might be kind of blurry. But this, these are some examples as to how inflammation could affect all the rest of the, the organs and the systems going on in your body. Something like your brain can be affected because if this chronic inflammation is happening, so again, we have a, a word here called cytokines. That's just another um, one of those other inflammatory cells that report for duty. So if these things are happening where you're having these, um, you know, excess amounts of inflammatory issues take place, then it can cause some autoimmune reactions to, to happen. That whole trigger factor happens. It could possibly lead to things like mental health disorders, like depression or Alzheimer's disease might be more at risk for. And again, with the caveat of you know, knowing better and hopefully doing better, not scaring you too much about things, but also recognizing whenever we see information like this, it's based in research, but we can't definitively say this equals that. So it's not like one cigarette is going to cause cancer or one, you know, unmanaged cold is going to make you have Alzheimer's disease. It's really a variety of factors and it's very hard to figure out how much of too much is anything. You're going to see that come up in a lot of, or you probably have heard that come up in a lot of past webinars. And I'll continue saying that because there's no way for us to figure out what the threshold is. It's really dependent on you as an individual. So all I can do is provide guidance and give some education for this, but it's really about you making sure you're keeping yourselves in check and, and checking with your doctors too, to see how at risk you might be for something. Okay, cardiovascular. So again, the heart is involved in a lot of things, disease, stroke, even anemia, because that's part of the blood world. If you have uh, anemia, that is not as severe as having a stroke, obviously, but that's another thing that could be affected if you have chronic inflammation going on. I'm going to jump down a little bit too, to something like the bones discussion and the muscles discussion, where you could have things like rheumatoid arthritis or fractures, osteoporosis. These could all potentially be related to chronic inflammation too. On the right-hand side, lungs, so respiratory conditions like asthma or also allergies too, whether you have it or it's getting worse or you never had it and now it's happening, possibly related to inflammation too that might be unmanaged and again, putting you more maybe at an increased risk for something um, or if you've never had something before, maybe it is related to, to a condition that caused you to be inflamed in the previous state kidney issues, liver issues, et cetera. So again, it's just how these things are building up in your body, what things might be a little bit more susceptible and just giving you an understanding that it really can affect a, a wide variety of things and just for you to be aware of what might come up. And the reason is that I share this with you is because there are two ways that we get diagnosed. And that's one of the things I like doing when we talk about these specific illnesses or conditions as I try to share with you the actual diagnosis of things, like what you're looking for on your blood tests or what you might want to ask your doctor to test you for. And also we talk about treatments as well so that you have some ideas of what's going on. 
So in the case of the true diagnosis, I don't believe that the CRP or the ESR that you see on screen here, the C-reactive protein or erythrocyte, that's just a fancy word for blood cells, and sedimentation, the way that they kind of you know uh, fall down to the bottom of the vial, these are two blood tests that I don't believe are part of a normal metabolic screening. So like for just going in for a physical exam, you might not see these on there, uh, but it also depends on how often you've gone to the doctor, if you're currently taking care of other conditions, then they might make this part of your normal blood test. The point being that if it's never been on a lab and you you know your body best, right? If you know something's off or it feels like this thing is not going away or you're constantly getting sick of something or whatever's happening in your life, it just feels like something's off, discuss with your doctor perhaps and I believe, you know, if you have insurance, it should be included. It shouldn't be an out-of-pocket expense, but discuss with your doctor about getting a, CR, a CRP or an ESR test done. So this way, you know for sure if you're in or out of range, and then you can make the appropriate um, treatment plan for yourself. I don't love self-diagnosing and I don't love self-medicating. So I'm really particular of not doing things or putting things into my body that are not necessary unless I can see for sure that there's an issue going on that I need to address. So I hope that's helpful. If you've never heard of those two diagnoses, those um, blood tests before, that that's something that you might want to consider if you're feeling like you're, you know, you're struggling with trying to manage something or curious about what's going on in your body. So we said before, you know, some risk factors of getting in to the chronic inflammation could be that you have a hard time recovering from an illness or your, your immune system's not doing great. These, unfortunately, are other risk factors, too, that can lead to chronic inflammation. As we age, I said that already, right, as we age. So again, I'm going to define something here. If you've never heard of what a mitochondria is, mitochondrial dysfunction basically just means that your cell is breaking down. There's a powerhouse in our cells that help with regulating how our body functions. It's it's in charge of so many different things. And so what ends up happening, just think of it like, you know, if you've ever driven a car, like your carburetor, I don't know anything about cars, but like your carburetor or your gas tank or your engine, right? If you need to take it to the mechanic to get fixed, like this is kind of what your mitochondria is doing. It's like, hey, I'm faulty. My gears are, are loose and falling off. Um, we need to kind of fix that if possible. But unfortunately, as we age, natural wear and tear happens. And this is just the name of the game, meaning that it's putting you a little bit more at risk for chronic inflammation. But as I think I mentioned earlier, you know, it's a combination of all these things. It's not that's not one equals one, right? It's like maybe you're aging, but also you're dealing with other things. And as you can see on screen here, you know, maybe other of these things too are on the checklist as well. So all of these things put together just increase the risk of potentially having a chronic inflammation happening for you. Body composition. I try to be really conscientious when I talk about body weight and body fat, because not everybody in a fat body or a larger size body is automatically metabolically unhealthy. And not every person in a skinny, thin, smaller size body is automatically healthy. But there are some, there is some research out there that does correlate that excessive amounts of fat tissue or depending on where our body fat is, like if it's higher up towards the heart versus down in the lower region, like our butt, it's possibly linked to a higher increase of of having these inflammatory issues happen. Diet, we're gonna go a little bit more into detail in the coming slides, so excessive, right? So listen to the language again, excessive intakes, how is that defined? Who knows, more than what we would recommend. Saturated fats, trans fats, and refined sugars. We're also gonna talk a little bit too in a second about highly processed or ultra processed foods. Those could also increase our inflammatory markers. So put us at more risk factors for chronic inflammation. My friends, if you haven't learned by now, tobacco, chewing tobacco, smoking, not great for you, not great. And I've uh, admitted in our previous web webinars that I am a former smoker, 23 years. I never thought I would pick up a cigarette. And then once I did, I did not stop. It took me four years to quit. And I'm 12 years smoke free now, but I still feel sometimes the consequences of it. Like I don't feel my endurance, my stamina is as great as it used to be because my lungs are still repairing and healing. So definitely tobacco plays a role in inflammation as does alcohol. But I'm just going to caveat by saying we've seen in moderation. So again, how we define moderation for alcohol is usually four ounces of wine or a bottle of beer or a jigger, a shot glass of liquor once a day and especially with red wine could technically be preventative and could be heart healthy, like in the Mediterranean diet, red wine is included in that. However, 
there is a lot of research that kind of counteracts that and contradicts that because alcohol technically is a carcinogen, meaning it can cause cancer. So the rule of thumb is usually if you've never drunk alcohol, just don't. If you are drinking alcohol, please do it as limitedly as possible, if limitedly is a word. And try to stick within that, you know, do I really need it? Or is it just something that, you know, because again, the pros don't necessarily outweigh the cons when it comes to alcohol um, intake. So it can cause inflammation in the body too. Hormones are in charge of every stinking thing as well. So if you have any kind of low levels of or altered hormone health, this would be something that you would be talking to your physician, but also maybe an endocrinologist might come into play as well here if you're dealing with hormone issues. So that would be thyroid, a thyroidologist. And um, this would also be related to things like diabetes. So if you're having issues with hormone related conditions, this could also put you at risk for higher uh, increase of chronic inflammation. The bottom right, this is another two things that I talk about all the time. It has nothing to do with diet, but it kind of does with, with overall health and wellness. Stress and sleep go hand in hand because that is one of those things that also triggers our cellular functions from doing or not doing what they're supposed to do. So we're talking about, in the world of sleep, we're talking about um, quality and quantity. So if you're not a great sleeper, tossing and turning, you're not feeling super refreshed, or you're like, I can live on three hours a night. No, you can't. You can't because internally your body is suffering the consequences of that. Stress also easier said than done. There might be things going on in your life, financial, relationship, work-related stuff, whatever the case may be, current events, environmental factors, right? We talked about that also, if you were with me with the um, smart goals discussion. We talked about dimensions of wellness and things that can cause stress. It's like a number one concern that can then affect how the rest of your body and the rest of your decisions are being made. So see if there are ways that you can alleviate stress however you can, whether it's journaling, meditation, or socializing, or um, you know, going to therapy. That's always a good one too. So make sure that those things are part of your lifestyle modifications because you can reduce the risk factors that are taking place there. All right, so I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper into the three things that we just saw underneath that diet section here. So your inflammatory cells, right? I gave you information on that. And now we have inflammatory foods. Left-hand side, we have saturated fats. These are, so we have macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Fats is one of the macronutrients. In saturated world, mo molecularly speaking, this is any kind of fat or oil that would be solid at room temperature. So like a butter. Um, you know, any of the fat marbling that you see around steaks or the fatty part of something like a chicken or any kind of meat product. But you can also see solid at room temperature, coconut oil, right? Coconut is technically a plant-based product. People tend to think it's a quote unquote healthier version, but it can also exacerbate some inflammatory conditions and also can contribute to um, cardiovascular issues as well. So once again, how much of too much is anything? If that's something that you have been cooking with, maybe you want to alternate it with olive oil instead, or maybe you want to do a leaner cut of meat and maybe, you know, ease up on the fried foods, that sort of thing. The middle trans fats, you might've heard this being used as well. So there's naturally occurring trans fats in certain foods and it's very, very negligible, but there are also artificial forms of trans fats. These are known as partially hydrogenated oils. The good news here, my friends, is your food and drug administration, your government has banned these. So these are no longer allowed in any manufactured foods. And even in some restaurants too, that used to use those hydro partially hydrogenated oils to deep fry things like, you know, chicken wings or French fries or whatever, they've been banned. They're banned. Um, the way that the food and drug administration works is that they look at certain things, like I said, the threshold, and they'll say certain food items are generally recognized as safe, meaning odds are you wouldn't be eating enough of these things to cause any issue. But over the course of the last decades, they've decided that trans fats are no longer considered safe. And so they've removed them completely. They, they're carcinogenic now, we've come to learn. Unfortunately, I have a note here that um, the Food and Drug Administration gave food manufacturers three years from 2018 to 2021 for them to completely eliminate their trans fats from their food supplies. And you'll usually see trans fats in things like pastries, baked goods, or sometimes, like I said, fried foods as well. But because of COVID, unfortunately, there were some extensions that were given. And also what ends up happening here, because this provides taste 
and palatability, right? I like to eat things that are fried and have these like really good mouth feel buttery types of flavors that they have to substitute it with something else. So not to put a big bummer on this discussion, it's possible 20 years from now, whatever they're substituting with might also be an issue. But what we're going to come to see and some of my suggestions are, again, you know, spreading things out, trying to focus a little bit less on things that are going to cause problems and a little more on things that are going to prevent the problems from happening in the first place. On the right hand side, we have refined sugars. So I gave three examples here. We extract sugar from corn, sugar beets, and sugar cane. Corn in itself is actually fantastic. It's a whole grain. It's fibrous. It's great for our body. Depends on whether or not you enjoy it yourself. And obviously, again, portion sizes, because it is more, it's a sweeter type of vegetable. So it depends on how much you're eating. But when we extract it, like we make corn syrup or high fructose corn syrup, we start refining that food and it becomes less nutritious. So there's not, it's not bringing a lot of nutritional value and it's causing our body to have to kind of go through a different mechanism to figure out like, how do I get rid of this thing, right? It's not providing me with any use, but it's now pocketing into fat cells or it's like pocketing into an artery. So it's converting into things that possibly can cause damage and it can raise our risk of inflammation. So I thought I just wanted to share that with you as well, as far as inflammatory foods. I also want to share this thing about High, highly processed or ultra processed foods. We see this come up a lot in discussions. We see this come up on television shows all the time. And again, I wanna be really careful with the language that we use around this because not everybody has access to or can afford the best quality everything or has the time to make things from scratch or has the ability to get you know organic versions of things. So again, I try to be really careful not to vilify, not to put fear in you. If you are getting more, processed foods in your diet, or if you're getting more convenient food items in your diet, because that just might be what you have to do right now. But I'll say from left to right, these are great examples of how much of too much is anything, right? So on the left-hand side, that is a an ear of corn, a corn cob. Technically, that's a processed food because it's not sitting in the fight in the field. It's been pulled from the field. It's traveled to its destination and it's sitting on top of a, a table right now. So it, there has been a small amount of processing done to it, but you can still recognize it in its whole form. In the middle, you have a more processed version of that. So now we've taken the kernels off, we've canned them, or maybe we've frozen them. Maybe we've added some things to make it shelf stable. It's not as processed uh, and we still recognize this as a food but it's still a form of processing. And then on the right-hand side, as a comparison, you've now pulverized that corn. You've now added maybe a load of salt into it and some other additives and you smushed it down. That is no longer a nutritious food in any shape or form. This is now a very highly processed food. So if we look at like our, you know, every meal, every day, every week, however often you're eating, I tend to work on like an 80-20 split. 80% of the time I'm sticking to the left and middle and maybe 10 to 20% of the time I'm dealing with the right-hand side stuff. As much as I like cooking and eating, sometimes I just don't have the time to do everything. And I also grant myself the freedom to have some balance in my diet too. So like you want a cookie, have a cookie. You want a potato chip, have a potato chip. Obviously, keeping in mind any health considerations, like if you have a chronic condition or a food allergy where you would have to 100% avoid something, yes, for sure. But generally speaking, you know, a little bit of, otherwise, what's the fun in life if you can't have a potato chip every once in a while? But take a look at where your diet is currently. Are you, just by diet alone, increasing your risk of getting chronic inflammation because your body is taking in a lot of saturated fats, a lot of highly processed foods, a lot of foods with refined sugars in them. All right. So I want to go into, like I said earlier, some of the potential treatments that we'll talk in a second about lifestyle modifications, but some of the medications that you may have come across or that you might be put on, because even with certain conditions that we can manage through lifestyle changes, sometimes it's just the name of the game for our body just to calm down a second while we try to get other things in order, or we might have a very serious condition that the only workaround, the only way to treat it is through medicine. So I'm just, I'm just disclosing here. I'm not a pharmacist. I'm not a medical doctor. I can't really go into too many details as to what you're seeing in front of you, but I'm just giving you some 
information because it's possible your doctor has put you on some of these things, or these might be things you might want to entertain and ask about later on. There could, with anything, there could be long and short-term side effects or issues that happen, especially in the medical pharmaceutical discussion, because these things will metabolize either through our kidney or our liver. So if you're on things for a long period of time, or if you're constantly dealing with certain um conditions on and off, like I mentioned before with UTIs, you know, these might be things that you're put on for short term, but all the time, every so often, every six months, every year, and then it kind of adds up and can cause problems later in life. So NSAIDs might be one of the most common things like ibuprofen or naproxen, you'll see that as, again, this is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. People tend to say, try not to take these too much. They can damage stomach issues, et cetera. And again, these are more short-term. Uh, cortico steroids or steroids as they're known, like prednisone. So these things suppress the immune system. So by doing something to stop inflammation from happening, it's also damaging your overall immune system. So these will also probably kind of be kind of short-term. I actually recently had um, a skin condition. So my doctor put me on a topical steroid treatment and his exact words were, not too much and for only two weeks and then you stop because it's a very strong medicine. So you're just gonna put a very thin layer on for two weeks and that's it. If it resolves, it resolves. If it doesn't, we'll figure out what to do next. The next thing there, disease modif modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So if you're taking something like methotrexate, that's where that category lies in there. That again, could be um, if you have arthritis or a rheumatoid issue. Um, again, we're su they're suppressing any of the inflammation that's happening that's causing your joints or your back or your pain to happen. Um, but in doing so, you're also compromising your overall immune system. Same thing with that next one up there, the biologics. Um, the one I have here as an example is called adalimumab. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly because these also, also target, uh, it's an anti-inflammatory. It inhibits TNF which is um, tumor necrotic factor, if you feel like knowing that. So it inhibits the natural pathway from happening to stop from happening so that you can your body can you know ease up on what's going on there. So it's possible you're on a biologic or you want you might want to inquire about that. The next three are a little bit more newer in the world. I mean not new because they've been around but being more studied now. However, I've been looking at the research and it looks like they're only laboratory animals. So like you know lab rats and animal studies, not a lot of studies done on humans. So some things might be considered safe but not yet known as effective. And some things might not be kind of like clinical chances that you might be taking. So CBD, CBD oil has come up a lot, especially if you're dealing with cancer, cancer treatments, uh, that's cannabidiol, cannabidiol oil, right? That's what people associate with marijuana, but it's like the extraction from it. Stem cell and platelet rich treatments. So those are more biological, like, you know, human identical type of things. Um, the stem cell treatment I recently saw come up in a lot of discussions around Parkinson's disease and platelet rich plasma has come up in, um, I work with, uh, you know, my physical therapist talks a lot about people he's working with there. So joint issues, runners, athletes, they, um, they might undergo platelet rich plasma treatments. Some of these things are not covered by insurance. Some of these things are kind of, you know, quote unquote fringe or experimental. But I figured I'd just share that with you because again, maybe you're being put on stuff and not told about the risk factors or long-term effects of it. Maybe you're being put on things kind of temporarily while you try to figure out your lifestyle modifications. And these definitely, these are things that sometimes just go hand in hand. I don't deny anyone conventional medicine because it's an immediate source of, you know, relief, but definitely um, be conscientious and try to educate yourself as to what might be the problem if you're on things all the time, long term. That you know, could it cause kidney damage? Could you could you have liver failure? Could it cause you know any other issue? Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say on this slide. Now we're in my wheelhouse, yay! So let's talk about natural remedies for inflammation. A lot of these things are foods in their natural whole food form, like bell pepper and nuts appear on this list. And some of these things are known as phytochemicals or antioxidants, which are the naturally occurring chemical properties within these plant-based foods or in some of these even animal-based foods like omega-3 fatty acids are found in fish like tuna and salmon. So take a look at this slide, top to bottom here, are do 
do you recognize a lot of these words? Like, do you know where bromelain comes from? Do you know what capsaicin is? Are you familiar with anything? If not, you can add it to the chat or throw into the question. And I'm, I'm going to go a little bit more into detail into some of these things as well. Turmeric, I think, is kind of popular. Turmeric, it looks like a, a ginger root. It's kind of like scrubby looking, but it's very, very yellow. It stains everything. Um, people sometimes ground this up and make it into tea or they slice it up and add it to a meal. Like, you know, they'll shred it or shave it like they would a piece of ginger. We also have things like broccoli. So any of your broccoli, kale, these cruciferous vegetables, these things have great cancer fighting properties to them. They also have vitamin K, which helps support our immune system in the lower gut and um, I didn't see anything in the chat just yet. So I'll give away the spoiler alert. Bromelain actually is a, an enzyme or a chemical substance found in pineapple. So if you like pineapple, great. You know, these are things that you can consider adding to your diet or adding to your meals if they're missing from it. As we're going through the middle column there, resveratrol. I'm not sure if anybody knows what resveratrol is. Uh, I think about 10 years ago, it was like all the rage. People were selling pills and supplements with resveratrol as an anti-aging supplement. Um, it is technically the chemical substance found in the skin of red grapes. So this is also why the red wine discussion sometimes comes in as a pro, you know, helping with um, being an anti-inflammatory property because it's the, the skin of the red wine, but I'm also like, yeah, but it's still alcohol. So I would rather just eat the grapes and, you know, maybe not take a drink if I didn't have to. Capsaicin, capsaicin is a chili pepper extract. So just as a side note here, I want to also disclaim some of these things could be also conflicting with or interacting with current other foods, supplements, or medicines that you're taking. So just be conscientious of that. Some people end up saying they don't feel great when they have peppers or tomatoes. They don't like if you have um, inflammatory bowel uh, not inflammatory, sorry, irritable bowel um, syndrome, IBS, right, where you're dealing with uh, bloating and gastric discomfort and maybe abdominal cramping, garlic and onions might not be the way to go. Broccoli might not be the way to go. So these might be foods that you would not necessarily, you'd have to limit or avoid entirely if you're dealing with certain conditions. So I just want to also disclaim that just because these things are natural remedies for inflammation and we encourage you to include them in your diet, always check with your dietitian or your healthcare provider if they are right for you. So capsaicin, as I was saying, is a chili pepper extract, and it has been known to have analgesic or pain killing properties to it. Again, you're probably not taking as much as you need to, to get to that point. But the point is, is, you know, a little bit of sprinkle here and there of everything. You end up diversifying your diet. You end up giving yourself a little bit of everything. I'm also keeping my eye on the time here because I said I was going to keep this to 40 minutes and I, I'm a little bit over. I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Uh, bought berries, cherries, anything vibrantly uh, colored. Again, great cinnamon has been shown some of the properties there to also help with alleviating issues around diabetes. So if you sprinkle a little cinnamon in your coffee or add cinnamon to some of your meals, it's possible it can help support that and reduce inflammation as well. In addition to things like physical activity, stress management, and cutting back on any of those inflammatory foods that I mentioned before. So taking a look at this thing, seeing some ideas, but I thought I'd give you some visual representation, right? I hate just a list of words. That's not fun. So let's take a look here and just get some ideas. Is there anything that you see here that you think are, you know what? I haven't had that in a while. Oh, I could add some beans to my salad. Oh, I didn't think about putting, you know, curry or different herbs and spices into a soup or a stew. Um, walnut, roses, cr rosemary, crusted salmon. You're getting omega-3s. You're getting the good fats in there. You're also adding rosemary or any kind of herbs are technically also part of the plant foods and the green leafy foods. So that's going to help with um, also having anti-inflammatory properties as well. Here, left to right, some more examples, lentil soup, whether it's something that you bought at a can, obviously in that case, just be mindful of any excess uh, ingredients that they're using in it, like extra fat, salt, et cetera. Um, or if you're taking a dry bag of lentils or beans and making your own soup with it, there's turmeric in the middle, as I mentioned before. Fun fact, if you crack a little bit of ground pepper into anything that has turmeric in it, you actually boost the inflammatory properties of turmeric 
and my notes here say up to 2000%. So you get a little bit more bang for your buck just by cracking a little bit of black pepper into your turmeric food. And then right-hand side there, blueberries or any kind of berries added to your oatmeal or chia pudding, um, almonds, again, nuts, seeds, things like that will bring a lot of good properties and hopefully anti-inflammatory properties as well. But again, I always say, you know, take this into consideration with whatever your diet currently is, whatever conditions you're currently dealing with, whatever medications you're currently taking, because some of these things might have, anti, uh, they might um, kind of counteract some of those things as well. You want to make sure that these are all safe foods for you to eat. All right. So I'm going to wrap this up by asking you one question divided into three categories. So this is something I'm getting used to doing with a lot of our webinars. Based on all the stuff you heard, based on who you are right now in life, and also, you know, with my starting question about where do you want to be right now as far as like your New Year's resolutions, is there anything that you can take away from today, whether you want to share it with me or not, things that you want to start doing? And if so, when? When is that going to be implemented? How realistic? What's the next step you're taking for something that you want to start doing? In the middle, are there things that you're already currently doing? Like you're like, you know what? I did make a doctor's appointment and I did ask about this and I am exercising and I'm, I am including these foods into my diets. Is there something that you want to continue or keep doing? And on the right hand side, is there something that is no longer serving you that you know you probably shouldn't be doing that you're really trying to actively stop because it's not a great behavior or it's causing your condition to be worse? Is there something that you can commit to, hold yourself accountable, set up a boundary for, and then say to yourself, I'm going to stop doing this particular thing. So again, if you want to share with me in the chat, cool. If not, you can talk amongst yourselves or whoever is in your circle that you feel comfortable and want to confide in so that they can help support you in your health and wellness journey. But try to try to make something, like something come out of each one of these webinars. What's the next thing you can do to help with whatever it is that you're working on? 